See, people who think they're above accountability act very differently than those who know that they're going to have to face accountability, right? Uh, Several years ago, a major scandal hit the Lexington airport. I remember reading about it in the newspaper back when I read the newspaper. Um, And it it was these airport officials had mismanaged their expense accounts. I mean, horrendously mismanaged their expense accounts. They bought all kinds of stuff for themselves. And uh, it was from December, uh, from January 2006 to December 2008, they had spent more than $500,000 on frivolous stuff, including, and I quote, Wii game consoles and controllers, four shotguns, three Remingtons of Benelli, computer equipment, a portable digital television, DVD, an Aquamate breathalyzer. Guy needed a breathalyzer. Let's wonder why. All right, blood pressure monitor, dozens of clothing items, and two tuxedos. These were, these were bought with expense account money, and, and the scandal showed their very lax protocols in place. No one bothered to audit expense accounts. No one bothered to check. And these people thought they were above the law, and they acted accordingly. The people who believe they're above it all act very, very, very differently. And that's what we see in the church, specifically American Christianity today. See, when I was a young Christian back in late high school, early college, and I was forming my beliefs, it was right smack in the middle of the seeker-sensitive movement. That was the the secret sense of movement kind of went like this. We we need to downplay all the stuff that will keep people out of church, okay? We want tons of people in the church. We want our churches full, and so we need to downplay all the stuff that would keep people out of it. You know, we don't need to talk about the wrath of God. We don't need to talk about uh, uh, repentance. We don't need to talk about the cross. We don't need to talk about hell. We need to downplay all that other stuff, and we need to start a mass marketing campaign about all the good stuff, about the Christian faith. And so we started seeing uh, coffee mugs with, with slogans like, the safest place, place to be is in the center of God's will. Well, if you read the Bible for more than five minutes, you know that's not true. All right? Uh, and we, we saw all kinds of, of um, uh, God it loves you and has a plan for you. Well, well, that's true. But that's not the whole story. Okay? Judgment, wrath, punishment for sin were all downplayed in, in favor of things that were, that, that, that were nice and good and attractive because those things turned people off. And things that the, the Bible constantly emphasized as part of the Christian faith were downplayed. The return of Jesus, sermons on hell, disappeared from American pulpits and Bible studies. And what's been the result of that? Has the church become more faithful? Has it become more holy, more surrendered to God's will? Have we been more effective in reaching the lost? Have we been more effective in in raising up uh, another generation of Christian children that take the Bible seriously? Well, well, I mean, the answer is a resounding no. Because there's little fear of God in churches. And we act accordingly. Many Christians, pastors included, behave like the diplomat in chips. Using the grace of God as some type of a diplomatic immunity, think that we're all, we're above it all. That 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 no punishment for sin or no accountability. We'll, we'll never be held accountable for disobeying the word of God. That's what we that's what we act like. We act like we can do whatever we want with no consequences or accountability will ever cross our path. That's because the fear of God has almost completely disappeared from the pulpits. In Bible studies in American Christianity, and it's crazy to me, you guys, because if you ever read the Bible, the fear of God is seen as the greatest positive you could ever have. It's incredible. The fear of God is the greatest thing in the, in the world. It's like the highest virtue for the Christian. It's incredible that that's been removed from our church and we destroyed one of the greatest things in the Bible. Check this out. When I was studying for this, I was astounded. Look at this. In Exodus chapter 1, 15 through 17. Now, now the, the, the Israelites were in Egypt. They were slaves, and they were getting too many, so the king made an edict. It says this, The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were, uh, 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 When you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. So they were instructed to commit infanticide. But look what happens. However... The midwives feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. 
The fear of God was seen as the greatest thing. That was what motivated them to do what was right, to go against this, this sinful edict, to commit infanticide. The fear of God was what did it. Okay? And uh, just a few, chap- a few chapters later, in Exodus 18, Moses has already led the Israelites out of, out of Egypt, out of slavery. And he's, they're like, there are millions of them. And, and he's sitting before them as the judge, day and night, dealing with every little squabble and every little, and he's wearing himself out. Well, mother, uh, Moses' father-in-law saw that his, wife, that his daughter and grandkids were being neglected by Moses. So he goes up to Moses and he says this in, in verse 19 through 23. Listen now to me and I will give you some advice and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way that they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men. Check this out. Select capable men from all the people. Men who what? Fear God. Trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter and, uh, um, because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand a strain and all these people will go home satisfied. What was the number one requirement to be a judge in this system? Fear God. Wow. That was the number one thing they were looking for. People that feared God. In Joshua chapter 24, it's 14 through 15. One of the most famous verses of the Bible is verse 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's all over there. You can buy little plates and put on your house and everything like that. The verse before that, look what Joshua says. Now, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshiped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Serving the Lord starts off with the fear of the Lord. You cannot have one without the other. Okay, and the list just goes on and on and on. I could, I could spend the next week telling you about all the passages talking about fearing God. And how that's the greatest positive. But also the opposite is true. People that don't fear God, that have no fear of God before them, are seen as terrible. It's a negative. It's not seen as a good thing in the Bible. In Romans chapter 3, verse 13 through 18, Paul is listing the people that are going to face God's judgment. It's a bad list, people. And, I, and here, here's some of it. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Paul was basically saying that the lack of fear of God was the same as being swift to shed blood. The negative. This, 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 This amazing concept about fearing God has just disappeared from our churches and from our lives and from our homes. Why have we become so foolish as to edit the fear of God out of our lives, out of our churches? Why are we content to have churches and families that don't fear God? Building our churches with people who are perfectly content to flaunt God's ways and his will and being perfectly fine with it, using the grace of God as a diplomatic immunity. The Bible holds up people who fear God in the highest regard, the highest virtue, constantly stating over and over again that people who fear God win at life. And this is how it works. My fearing God leads to winning at life. First thing is this. It brings perspective. Everybody say perspective. Perspective. Psalm 33, 8 says this. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. Okay. Let's just take that statement right there. Let the earth fear the Lord, let all the people of the world revere him. Many of us this morning, in here and online, have the wrong perspective, okay? You're wonderful people. I love you. You're incredible. But we have the wrong perspective because we've got a wrong foundation in our minds. See, a lot of people have been taught that Jesus is just this nice guy, kind of a a nice guy, passive, kind of wandering around, begging people to accept him, begging people to believe in him. It's the way he's portrayed a lot of times. God is not a, God's a nice addition to your otherwise busy life, and he kind of helps you with your problems, but that's really about it. That's what a lot of people believe about God, if we were honest. 
Why fear someone when all they do is love you and have a plan for your life? Why fear someone who's a combination of hippie and Mr. Rogers? Unfortunately, that's, that's a view many ha- of us have of God in here this morning and online. We've lost perspective. People, the truth is that God is as much wrath as he is love. He's as much power as he is grace. He's as much strength as he is forgiveness. And that truth has major implications for our lives, right? He's not to be messed with or trivialized or minimized like so many of us are, he, are, are in the habit of doing. He's God, you all. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He's not wandering around begging people to believe in him. In fact, he says, you cannot be my disciple unless you, for, unless you forsake everything. Unless you throw everything away, you cannot be my disciple. That's what he says to us. If he's not first, he's not there at all. He's God. And one of the guys that was a huge influence on me in my early ministry years was a guy named Mike Yacanel, and he wrote this. It's called The Safety of Fear. And I love I go. I read this constantly because it just brings back my perspective. And he says this, the tragedy of modern faith is that we're no longer capable of being terrified. We are, aren't afraid of God. We aren't afraid of Jesus. We aren't afraid of the Holy Spirit. As a result, we've ended up with a need-centered gospel that attracts thousands but transforms no one. What happened to the bone-chilling, earth-shattering, gut-wrenching, knee-knocking, heart-stopping, life-changing fear that left us speechless, paralyzed, and helpless? What happened to those moments where you and I would open up our Bibles and be trembling because we were afraid of the truth that we might find there? Unfortunately, those of us who've been entrusted with the terrifying, frightening good news have become obsessed with making Christianity safe. We've defanged the tiger of truth. We've tamed the lion. And now Christianity is so sensible, so acceptable, so palatable. We're afraid of unemployment. We're afraid of our cities. We're afraid of the collapse of our government. We're afraid of not being fulfilled. We're afraid of disease. We're not afraid of God. I would like to suggest, he writes, that the church become a place of terror again, where a place where God has to continually tell us, do not fear. A place where our relationship with God is not just a simple belief or theology or doctrine, it's God's burning presence in our lives. I am suggesting that the tame God of relevance be replaced by the God whose very presence shatters our egos into dust, burns our sins into ashes, and strips us naked to reveal the person within. The church needs to become a gloriously dangerous place where nothing is safe except us. We have to be more in awe of God than we are of government, more in awe of God than we are of our problems, more in awe of God than we are of our beliefs about political issues, more in awe of God than we are of our doctrines and agendas. Our God is perfectly, perfectly capable of calming the storm or placing its right smack in the middle of it. Either way, if it's God, we'll be speechless and trembling. Our world is tired of people whose God is tame. He writes, uh, it is longing to see people whose God is big and holy and frightening and gentle and tender. And ours, a God whose love frightens us into his strong and powerful arms where he longs to whisper those terrifying words, I love you. Fear of God brings perspective. Second thing it brings, it brings, cur- it brings wisdom. Psalm 110, 111.10 says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. It, to him belongs eternal praise. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Maybe one of the reasons we don't have much wisdom in our society right now is because there's no fear of God. Because you can't have f- wisdom without fear of God. Now, how does this work? Well, you ever see the difference in a politician's behavior when the cameras come on? Anybody see the difference? Yeah. You see pictures of them without the cameras on and pictures with the cameras on. It's a remarkable difference, isn't it? Yeah, it's interesting. It's laughable. It was also the way we are too. We behave very differently, people, when the cameras are on, when people are watching. I was told early in my ministry, this was amazing, I was told early in my ministry as a young minister to never do anything or say anything that I would not want displayed on that screen behind me. Woo! That's, uh, that's a bone chiller right there. Uh, that's a perspective shifter. See, guys, that forces me to think of accountability. That makes me pause and think the consequences of my actions. And because I think of the consequences of my actions, therefore I use wisdom. See, 
That, that thought right there has probably saved me from saying and doing more things that would destroy me, my ministry, my family, everything, than anything else. See, of course, though, people, it's always on the screen in front of God. Always. We can't hide anything from Him. Realizing that God holds the keys to heaven and hell, that He sees it all, actually is an amazing thing. What if politicians feared God? What if they knew that every bribe Every backroom deal, every hypocrisy was on full display before God. What if they knew that? That's why Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, told Moses to appoint judges who feared God because they would use wisdom. They would know that every decision, every word, every deal was laid bare before God and therefore they would choose wisely, not recklessly. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. During the lockdowns last year, one of the things that was constantly talked about was a prevalence of domestic violence. Some of you in here may have been victims of that domestic violence when, when children were not in school. See, schools and teachers in particular are a major source, if not the major source, of uncovering child abuse. And, and because the children weren't in school, it was easy for abusers to abuse children and, and no one know about it because everyone was home. The abusers were far more likely to abuse the people in their homes if they knew no one would see it. So what if we all behaved in our homes? Mothers and fathers and children as people who are on display before God. Face accountability. That we'd face accountability for every blow up, every word spoken in anger, every fist raised to strike, every back talk, every gesture of disrespect. What if we behave if all of those things were on full display before God and we would be held accountable for them? We would behave very dis- differently, wouldn't we? We would. We would choose wisely. That's why the fear of God leads to wisdom. Everything is on display before Him. You can't hide anything from God. Knowing that, having that fear of God makes you a decent person. Because you behave very differently when you know you'll face accountability. Fear of God is beginning wisdom. Without the, that fear, we're fools, the Bible says. The third thing it brings is this. It brings courage. The fear of God brings courage. Right? Jesus says this in Luke 12, 4 through 5. He's talking to all his disciples and his followers. He says this. This is from Jesus. This is an Old Testament. This is from Jesus. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will tell you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body's been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Wow. Here's the Son of God telling us who we should fear and who we shouldn't fear. See, Jesus speaks of two types of fear here. Fear of God and fear of people. You have one, you don't have the other. Fear people, you don't fear God. Fear God, you don't fear people. That's the way it is presented here. No coincidence he talks about how one overshadows the other. Fear of God is the, is the only fear that actually leads to courage. All right? All other fear destroys courage. Um, when I was a kid, I read Robinson Crusoe. Great masterpiece by, by Daniel Defoe. It's about a, about a guy who uh, is shipwrecked. He, 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 he uh, is a wild and reckless and, and lack, lack of self-control, live for the party kind of guy. And he takes off against his father's wishes to go seek adventure and excitement. Well, he's, he's shipwrecked. And one of the things that washes up on the shore with him is a Bible. And he begins to read it. And he dedicates his life to God. And he becomes a Christian. And, and he begins to live by faith. His faith explodes there on the island. It's really pretty neat. And it all was going great. Until one day when Robinson Crusoe found a footprint in the sand that was not his. And he realized he wasn't alone on the island, and he knew of the neighboring tribes penchant for cannibalism. And he, he, all of a sudden, he became fearful. He, he did not sleep well. He looked over his shoulder every, every chance. He altered his habits and his, and his patterns. He visualized himself constantly being captured, boiled, and eaten. Crusoe states this, thus my fear banished all my religious hope. All that former confidence in God, which was founded upon such wonderful experiences I had had of his goodness, now vanished as if he, had, he that fed me by his miracles hitherto could not preserve by his power the provision that he had made for, my, for me by his goodness. As soon as fear entered, fear of people, his fear of God left, and he realized that. Listen, people, you will either fear God and fear nothing else, or you will not fear God and fear everything else. The fear of God leads to courage. 
The early church understood this. It was growing rapidly. After the day of Pentecost, the the early church was growing rapidly, and the leaders were constantly being put in prison. Peter and John had healed uh, had healed a a man who was who was lame, and and they were uh, threw Jerusalem up into an uproar. So they arrest him, put him in jail, and the rulers dragged them in front of him. They were they're like, "Don't you be talking about Jesus in front of us!" And you're you're throwing this whole uh, city into an uproar. We want you to stop. And they beat him up really, really, really good. And Peter and John said this. Uh, they, they, they said, listen, we've got to obey God instead of you. You tell us what is right, Sanhedrin. You guys are religious people. Tell us whether or not it is right to obey God or to obey you. And they were like, we don't want to hear that. And they beat him up some more. And they threatened their lives. And they let him go. So the first thing that Peter and John do is they went to their helms and stayed put, right? No. First thing they did was they called a worship service of all the Christians. Huge worship service. And they had a huge prayer meeting. And they said this, they prayed this in Acts 4.29, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak with great boldness. Wow. That was in response to getting thrown in prison, beaten up, and their lives threatened. They said, Lord, consider their threats and then allow us to speak with great boldness. Why? Why didn't they go tuck tail and run? Why didn't they, why didn't they collapse into their own little, uh, little worlds and, and just not make any waves? Why didn't they do that? Easy, because they feared God. They didn't fear people. Plain and simple. Their only fear was God. Peter's only fear was not doing what God told him to do. That was the only fear he had in life. He was not afraid of anything else. Fear of God brings courage, and the fear of God will bring courage to this church too. It'll bring courage to you and your family. The fear of God. When you fear God, you will not fear anything else. The main thing is this, it brings the ultimate win. The fear of God brings the ultimate win. Psalm 86, 11, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. What is the result of an undivided heart before God? Fear of his name. That's the result. Um, the two biggest fears I've found people, and people have, first one's death, second one's life. Yes, people are afraid of life. Um, I mean, people are afraid of dying, that's for sure. I've, I've sat in hospital rooms with people that are dying, I've held their hand as they've, as they've passed into eternity. I've seen that. And even people that have decided to stop treatments, they know the cancer's taken over or, or, or they're, they're dying, they know that, and they've stopped treatments, and, and there's still a lot of fear there. There really is. Um, but people fear living even more. Think about it. How many people do you all really know that are just thrilled with life, that are just knocking the ball out of the park. They are exactly where they want to be in life. They're exactly where God wants them to be. They're doing exactly what God has them to do. They're full of joy. They're full of peace. They're full of patience. They're full, I mean, they're just knocking the ball out of the park. They are just loving life. How many people do you know like that? Well, how many, how many people do you know that are actually creating stories for themselves? How many people do you know that are actually making real memories, doing real things, bigger than just living vicariously through actors on a screen? How many of you all know people like that? How many of you all are like that? It, it, seriously, how many people know that, that, that many addicts that use drugs use it to escape life so they don't have to engage? Why do you think entertainment is a multi-billion dollar business? Why do you think our families are falling apart, our marriages are mediocre, our relationships are stale, we have no friends, and our churches are ineffective in reaching the lost? Plain and simple is, is that we're not living. We're afraid of living. We're more afraid of life than we are of death, afraid to truly live. See, the problem, people, is that life as God has given it to us. It's not a nicely neat package, uh, uh, a guaranteed, planned out, little predictable box. It's not. It's fun and exciting and dangerous and adventurous and risk-filled and joyful and engaging all at once. That's what life is as God designed it. All right? But most of us don't want that. We choose the boredom of safety over risk. We choose the humdrum of security over adventure. We choose a predictability of routine rather than the excitement of the unknown. And we die a little more every single day. Jesus tells us something radically different 
than the vision that this world has for you. In John 10, 10, he says, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. That is what Jesus says. That's what happens when you fear God and you don't fear anyone else. It brings the ultimate win of life. Ultimate win of life. Life to the full. Does that describe you right now? Life to the full. How many of you all, when someone asks how you're doing, up, oh, life to the full? Really? That is what Jesus has for you. And most of us are missing it. Let me give you an ex- example of what life to the full, not as we define it, but as God defines it. Y'all ready for this? You don't want to know what God defines as life to the full? You don't want to know what the fullness of God really is? This is a, a, a thousandth of one thousandth of a percent of what it means the God's fullness, okay? This is what it is. God had to create an entire universe full of billions of galaxies, even each with billions of stars in them, just to show how great he was. Created the earth full of mountains, lakes, rivers, oceans, hills, scenery. He created sports, work, families, uh, people, hobbies, and interests. He gave us taste buds to enjoy food. He gave us bodies to exercise and use for good. He gave us more food than we could ever eat, more water than we could ever drink, and more things to do during a 24-hour period than we could ever do in a lifetime. And that's just a one thousandth of one thousandth percent of the fullness of God. That's just a glimpse that we don't engage with. We don't engage with it. We fear it. We fear doing something new. We fear failure. We fear injury or sickness. We fear everything and anything except missing out on what God has for us in life. Many of us fear everything except missing out what God has. We don't fear that. We're apparently perfectly comfortable with coming to the end of our lives, people. And saying, well, didn't do much with this life, but at least I was safe. At least I was secure. At least I didn't make any waves. And all this life that was offered me, all the things that God filled this earth for me to experience and do, and eh, I'll pass. After all, what if something bad had happened? And we'll continue to be half-hearted, fearful creatures muddling and messing about with trivialities. When real life is offered us. We'll raise our children to be half-hearted, fearful, fearful creatures who muddle and mess about with trivialities when real life is offered them. They will learn from us that the most exciting thing, the vision, you know you've arrived when you get a new set of clothes or the newest gizmo or watch the newest episode on a screen generation of people living lives of quiet despair, raising another generation of people living lives of quiet despair. How tragic. Human beings fear death. They fear life more. That much is certain. Just remember, just remember, your biggest regrets in life will not be the things you did and failed. No. uh -uh. Your biggest regrets in life will be the things that you didn't have the courage to to do the first time around. That will be your biggest regrets. The fear that you have, not of God, but of everything else, it will lead to your biggest regrets in life. And inside, the Spirit of God is telling us, those who fear me will fear nothing else. Fear me, calls God. Fear me and watch what will watch all your other fears melt into a blend oblivion. Fear nothing but me, God says. Proverbs 16, 6, though through love and faithfulness sin is atoned for, but through fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. I want to invite the band to come on back up. I'm just gonna just kind of kind of kind of lay my soul bare here, you guys. As a pastor and as your friend. I'm concerned about the lack of fear of God that I see in so many Christians, including myself, including people in this room that I dearly love. Many times, I'm the diplomat in chips, using the grace of God like diplomatic immunity, causing all kinds of problems, wrecking my life and others. Concerned about it in our homes. Is there the fear of God in your homes today? Really? Is there? Is there a fear of God in your home? 
Do we as a church behave as people that fear God? Would we be the people that Moses would select to be judges over the people because of our fear of God? Do we as a church behave as people who fear nothing else? Is our only fear people of God? Is our only fear not doing what God put us on this planet to do? Muddling and messing about in trivialities? Is that our only fear? Well, today is our 700th Sunday. I don't know if y'all know that or not. We've been, this is the 700th Sunday morning service Catalyst Christian Church has ever had. We start, yeah, amen. And that's God's faithfulness. We've had 700 weeks in existence in a, as a church. Some of you have been here for a long, long, the whole time. Some of you haven't. But here's the question that, that, that the Holy Spirit laid on me this morning as I was in my prayer time. Have we acted as a church those 700 weeks as people who fear God? Or have we acted as foolish people without the fear of God? Only you know that. Are there people in this church and joining us online who fear nothing but God? I pray that there are. Fear of God is the greatest thing that we can have. The greatest virtue that we can have. And I say it's about time that we stop fearing everything else. We start fearing God.